Thank you, and thank you so much for, for the invitation to, or the opportunity to speak to you today and to give you an update about what our team has been doing at Sema Therapeutics. Sema is a cell therapy company focused on insulin-dependent diabetes, and as many of you may know, it was 97 years ago that insulin was discovered as a therapy for, for this disease. And in the intervening 97 years, we've found better and better ways to manufacture insulin, to deliver it, whether through a syringe or a pen or a pump. But fundamentally, the treatment of this disease has been the same for nearly a century. And we think that that's long enough. So our mission is really to transform how we treat insulin-dependent diabetes. And we've based the company on technology that was developed uh, out of the lab of Professor Doug Melton at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute of the ability to generate a virtually unlimited supply of replacement islets, replacement beta cells from pluripotent stem cells. And the company was founded about two and a half years ago with Robert Millman and Doug Melton, and our mission is really to take this technology forward and develop it as a new therapy for these patients. So we really see uh, a, a number of steps uh, that really support us in the development of this therapy and the path to really a functional cure for these patients. The first I'll talk about is the large and motivated patient population, which probably needs very little explanation given that there are more than a million patients with type 1 diabetes in the U.S. alone. I'll tell you a little bit more about our breakthrough cell technology, uh, important developments really in proprietary delivery technologies, which is crucial for any development of a cell therapy the paths to the clinic and the endpoints and rapid readouts that we expect, and the team we have supporting us as we progress through this. So as I said before, uh, diabetes is really a very major uh, healthcare issue, not only type 1 diabetes, but also type 2 diabetes. And the estimates these days are that more than 400 million people worldwide suffer from this disease. And that includes more than 50 million people who currently inject themselves with insulin with this therapy. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the forms of diabetes, in all cases, it really comes down to this one very specialized cell type within the body called the beta cell. And the beta cells reside within your pancreas in little microorgans called islets with other endocrine hormones secreting cells within that mixture. And the beta cells are responsible for sensing glucose when you eat a meal and secreting insulin. And that insulin hormone is then responsible for telling the rest of your body, the peripheral tissues, to take up that sugar and use it for productive activities. And so what happens in type 2 diabetes in, in severe cases is that the stress of, of, of those high blood sugar levels lead to the beta cells becoming overworked and eventually uh, succumbing to, to, to dysfunction or death. In type 1 diabetes, as we talked about in the last uh, presentation, uh, is an autoimmune disease where the patient's own immune system actually attacks this uh, specific cell type within the pancreas, and you really lose all function of those insulin-producing beta cells. And so in both cases, you have millions of patients who are now uh, unable to control their own uh, blood glucose metabolism because they lack this single cell type. And because of that, it sets itself up as a perfect opportunity for a cell therapy, and in particular, a perfect opportunity for a pluripotent stem cell therapy, where we can, if we can find a way to regenerate those cells in a dish and replace them, then we have effectively a functional cure for, for this disease. And that's essentially what we have shown here. The other advantage that we have in this particular disease indication is that there's a tremendous amount of clinical proof of concept that this idea fundamentally works. So if you can isolate islets from cadaveric or organ donor pancreas and replace them under immunosuppression into patients with type 1 diabetes, you can provide those patients a functional cure for many, many years in which those replacement islets are actually performing the function that their endogenous beta cells no longer do. And so we know that if we can make the right cells and if we can deliver them to the patients, that this will work. And so the challenge for, for this therapy as a cell therapy for the last 20 or 30 years has been the supply limitation. Obviously, if you're using uh, cadaveric organ donors as your starting material, it's very difficult to control quality, and it's very difficult to supply enough quantity to treat the number of patients that we really want to impact. And the second challenge is the immunosuppression. So as I said before, type 1 diabetes does have uh, a therapy available, although the comorbidities are significant, the quality of life impact is very significant. 
but the, the uh, idea of providing long-term immunosuppression really doesn't have the right um, uh, risk-benefit trade-off for most patients with, with diabetes. And so we think solving both sides of this equation are critical to making a cell therapy a widely applicable option for patients with insulin-dependent diabetes. And we're really focused on both. So I'll start and just mention a little bit about uh, the stem cell technology that we have uh, developed. And here I'll, I'll just uh, gloss over all of the development work of the methods of how to make these stem cell-derived islets. But if there's one picture we want to leave you with today, it's this one. And so on the right side of this graph here, you can see a cross-section of one of those islets, those pancreatic islets, isolated from an organ donor. So this is what the islets in your and my body look like in green uh, around the uh, uh, picture you see insulin. So all of those cells are expressing insulin in their cytoplasm ready for release uh, upon trigger with glucose. And in red is a key transcription factor of beta cells. And what you can see on the left, I'm not sure how to use this pointer, what you can see on the left is uh, a picture of a cross section of a stem cell derived cell cluster, what we call a stem cell derived islet, manufactured entirely in a dish. And what I hope you can see, even from this very simple uh, diagram, is how similar uh, the cells we can now make in an incubator are to those that have been made in normal development in a patient's body. And obviously, we've done an enormous amount of molecular characterization, including in collaboration with Professor Melton's lab ongoing. Um, but we think this is really uh, a cell type now that's very comparable to what we see um, in patients. So, of course, the gene expression is important for characterizing a cell type, but most important for, for us is really the potency or the functional characterization of these cells. And we've spent a lot of our time uh, in development over the last couple of years at SEMA really focused on that potency question, because it's, a, it's one thing if we make a couple of beta cells that can secrete a little bit of insulin, but what we really need for patients is uh, a, a very potent cell source that secretes enough insulin to control their blood sugar on a regular basis, three meals a day and snacks and whatnot. And so what you can see here on this slide is an assay that we use routinely in the laboratory, both in terms of our research and in terms of our manufacturing, called glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And what we can do here is mimic what happens when you and I uh, eat breakfast this morning here at this beautiful conference, and we can take these clusters of cells and put them in a dish with either low level of glucose, which mimics how you and I woke up this morning with low levels of, of blood sugar, and then challenge those cells um, with an additional bolus of glucose, like if you had eaten uh, a pancake or a donut or something. And what our cells in our body normally do is respond to that increase in glucose, which is the black bar there, by secreting an increased amount of insulin. And that's exactly what these cells do in this assay in a dish when they're taken from, a, from an organ donor islet source. And that's exactly what these cells do in a dish uh, when they're taken out of our incubators, our stem cell-derived islets. And so you can see the challenge of uh, going from low glucose in the white bar to high glucose in the black bar, and the amount of insulin being secreted is, is really uh, very comparable to, to what's generated from uh, uh, the stem cell-derived islets and the natural islets. Importantly, of course, uh, this process has now been um, developed with a GMP cell line. It has been scaled into multi-liter bioreactors because, of course, in the case of uh, cell replacement for diabetes, we really want to replace a lot of that mass um, within the, the pancreas, which ends up being hundreds of millions of cells. And so we spent a lot of time uh, really focused on getting uh, the manufacturing under control so that we can routinely and robustly uh, make these cells. If, if I can convince you that we can make cells that are useful and potentially very useful for patients with, with diabetes, the next question is, of course, how do we get those into patients and protect them from the destruction, whether destruction uh, through an allogeneic-mediated uh, uh, reaction or through the autoimmune reaction in patients with type 1 diabetes. And so half of our company really is focused on this question of how do you deliver these stem cell-derived islets. And the key goals here are, as I said, to protect them from the immune system, but as importantly, to keep the islet cells alive and functional. And they require quite a lot of nutrients and oxygenation in order to, to really uh, maintain that peak function that we can observe uh, in vitro in a Petri dish. 
And so there are a variety of approaches that can be taken to delivery of cells into patients. Uh, the one on the left, the device encapsulation approach, is the one where we have focused as our uh, first entry into clinic, but we're very, very interested in things like engineered um, cells, and I know there are a lot of folks here at this meeting doing very interesting work on that side of it. Um, but we, we have really developed some innovative technologies that's on the device side. So our team uh, at our Providence, Rhode Island site has been focused on developing novel biomaterials, novel perm-selective membranes that have specific properties in terms of the um, types of, of uh, molecules that can be excluded from uh, the interior of that device and really protect those cells and keep them in pristine condition. And as important as the cells on the interior of the device uh, are the, the host tissue and the reaction of that host tissue uh, to the biomaterials and to the implanted encapsulation device. And so we really see this as our uh, path to the clinic. And I think that probably the most important milestone for us over the course of the last year since I last spoke to you all here is our preclinical uh, data package that we've been developing of that uh, encapsulated SC islet um, product. So these are an experiment where we've taken those stem cell derived islets uh, out of our incubators and put them into these uh, novel encapsulation devices that our team has developed and then put those into diabetic animals. So the graph here, and I'm not sure how to use this pointer. Well, that was not it. Uh, the graph you can see here is uh, one where we have each colored line a single diabetic animal. And what you can see in the uh, x-axis is the days post-implantation of the product. And so before the product is implanted, we induce these animals to become diabetic by destroying the mouse beta cells with a specific chemical. And so you can see on the y-axis that the blood glucose of those animals shoot up through the roof to the max of what we can detect. And as soon as we implant our stem cell derived islets in this encapsulation device, you see a rapid return to normal glycemia in these animals, and that's a very durable response. In this case, we took the animals out three months and then explanted that product, explanted those uh, encapsulated SC islets, and you can see that in the absence of that product, those animals return to hyperglycemic state, return to that diabetic state. And so we're really, really excited that this product um, has the potential to, to rapidly cure uh, diabetes in animals. Of course, the most important will be showing that this actually works in humans, which is, is the next step. And we think we have a, a very good shot at this because of the, the minimal foreign body reaction to the implant that we've observed and this really nice efficacy data that we're collecting in multiple rodent species now. So I think the, the other advantage for this particular cell therapy and this particular indication is that the regulatory and clinical path is quite clear. Uh, these patients, as I said, there's been um, significant clinical proof of concept with cadaveric islet uh, transplantation experiments. The clinical trials, we expect to require a few patients, again, learning from these cadaveric islet transplantation studies. The trials themselves have very clear and rapid endpoints, so you can easily take a patient who's not making any of their own uh, insulin, implant them with one of our products, and measure within the first weeks and months uh, whether the product is producing insulin, and more importantly, whether that patient is now able to uh, uh, maintain glycemic control in the absence of exogenous insulin injections and pumps and glucose monitors and, and all the rest. And so we really think that this is an exciting place to show the potential and make the potential of pluripotent stem cell technology a reality. So I won't spend much time on the team slide other than to highlight uh, Liz Stoner, who's our interim CEO and is really working with us on the clinical development. We're very, very excited about being at that phase as a company. And Chris Thanos, who has been leading our team of, of incredibly talented engineers on solving this uh, very long problem of encapsulation. Uh, it's certainly not a new idea, but I think uh, the uh, creativity that he's brought to it and his team have brought to it have really led us to a turning point uh, in that space. And then finally, I introduced just one other additional member of our team since uh, last year, so about 11 months ago, uh, Mark Fishman, the former head of Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research, joined our team as chairman of the board, and we're really thrilled to have his experience uh, on board, having uh, been responsible for developing the first approved um, um, cell therapy in immuno-oncology with the CAR-T, as I think all of us here are so excited about, um, and we're really grateful to have his uh, vision and guidance 
sense, and, and really to have his support that this is really the next big thing in cell therapy. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave you uh, with the summary slide and, and take any questions in the last 10 seconds, if there are any. Thank you. Oh, there's one. We, yeah, so we certainly have uh, data to suggest that uh, none of the cell-mediated killing um, can take place in the presence of the cells within this encapsulation device. Yeah. Thank you.